you're developing products and processes, it's normally because you've been put pressure on by you because there's been pressure put on the organizations to change. It's either regulatory changes or environmental changes or competitive changes. You have to change, you have to adopt because you, the existence of your company is probably at stake. And if you cannot respond, then you will probably not exist in the near future. And the worst thing that will happen is your stock price will collapse below book value and you will become a target and the raiders will come in and buy you out and gut your company and take your intellectual property and your market share and leave everybody everything else to waste. It's a brutal competitive market. So the first thing is, is what are the, you have to constantly do an environmental scan and calibrate the environment to your organizational structure and your culture. Okay? There will be some kind of industrial psychological dissonance that will occur between the market and your company. That dissonance, need, that gap needs to collapse. The question is, do you have the leadership and the culture and the systems in place and the personnel to be able to narrow that gap? And it's going to have major effects on individuals within the company and groups of individuals in the company too. So you will be forced to organize, organizationally change and restructure, which is extremely painful. Hopefully you will have the capital to do it and you will be able to restructure and optimize the organizational structure to align with the pressures and the changes within the marketplace so you can survive and thrive. You need cultural leadership. You need management. You need models internally that can communicate very clearly what the organizational changes are going to be and to create a cultural environment and an internal psychology at the group and individual level to basically move the company forward. Strategy, tactics, operations, and competition. You need planning at both the strategic, the tactical, and operating level, and they need to be aligned, and they need to be coordinated with each other. And they need to be clearly, clearly communicated and clearly defined. Product and process innovation is basically the outcome. Enterprise and resource management planning is really key. What are the resources? What do we have available to us? What do we need? How much is it going to cost? Can we get it together fast enough? Can we execute? Can we get it done in time before it starts to impair our company or impair um, our profitability? You got On the client level, you need to recognize the changes in the market and the new needs and the new wants of the client. What do they need? In 2008, 9, and 10, when the financial crisis was in its worst uh, phase, I had clients coming to me saying, I do not want to be in the stock market. Interest rates are already low, so the stock prices are really high. What products and strategies do you have available to you that will immunize myself and my portfolio from market volatility? Do you have any guaranteed product where I, will, I can invest in this product and not lose any money? The pressure was put upon us when I was at New York Life to innovate new products such as guaranteed uh, income annuities and to be able to innovate variable annuities with guaranteed attributes attached to it to basically meet the needs of the marketplace. And we now, can, or the company I work for, controls over 50% of the guaranteed annuity market, 50% of that product market. What did you say ERP was for? Enterprise resource planning. To be able to coordinate and monitor the resources available to you internally within the company. It all flows through. You know where your gaps are. You know where your resources are. To be able to meet the cultural and organizational change needs of the company. So it's a system that oversees all of the resources available to you and then you coordinate it. Okay. okay? Um, Product development, research and development, product development, you need to create product quickly to be able to respond to the marketplace. Financial products are the same thing. It took us like almost a year to develop those modified variable annuity and fixed uh, annuity products to be able to get to the market first to capture market share. And, and the company was able to, to do it. But there's sunk costs and there's opportunity costs associated with the time that it takes to develop the product and then deliver it to the marketplace through your distribution channels. Can you respond quickly? Theoretically, if you have the culture and the management and you have the personnel and you have the technology base in place, 
you can respond quickly, but it's usually cultural impediments that keeps you from being able to react. And myopic natures of bureaucratic institutions and the embedded groupthink and the politics that ends up usually creating the friction in most cases. So you got to design the product with the attributes that's going to solve the client's needs. You got to have the product production. You got to be able to manufacture it, and you got to be able to distribute it through existing and new distribution channels. What are those distribution channels? What is the optimal mix of the delivery system to push the product out to the customers that need it, and then be able to deliver it and close? You need channel distribution and networking and the mix among those uh, channel distributions. They need to be optimized, they need to be tested, and they need to be um, looked at that's going to maximize the revenue distribution. Uh, you have to have good supplier and chain distribution, so you, you need to have strategic partnerships and networks in place that are optimized, again, to be able to distribute the products and the products and services in a fashion to be able to get it to the marketplace so you can create the transactions, lock in the clients, and also be able to um, sell your product through multiple distribution networks. Uh, that's why the large uh, investment banks, the large banks have huge and wide global networks and distribution channels to be able to push out their product. Charles Schwab can come up with an equity mutual fund or an ETF and be able to raise $2 billion under management in 48 hours. Do they have optimal distribution networks and mixes? Yes, they do. They can come out with a product with a new attribute and be able to push it out and accumulate and get asset center management of $2 billion in 48 hours. That's pretty amazing, if you ask me. Marketing and market segmentation. You need to be able to identify your market, you need to be able to segment the market, and then you need to be able to target those markets to be able to channel the marketing messages with the product attributes to those segments and the demand for those products within those segments. And you need to optimize. You need to optimize the segments. So you target the markets and you're going to sell into these markets and they could be based on psychographic segmentation, sociographic, demographic, or economic segmentations. <clears throat> uh, advertising campaigns. Uh, large corporations have extensive advertising campaigns um, to be able to reach the market. They have optimal advertising mixes and they get a return on equity, advertising equity, advertising dollars. They know how to measure the return on advertising dollars. It's got to be net present value positive. It's got to be IRR positive. It's got to break even within a very short period of time. So there are very strict uh, benchmarks in which these advertising campaigns uh, are to be put in place, and if they fail, they go to the next one, and they innovate in the next one. Once you get the advertising in place and you've targeted the market, you now have the clients locked in. So you're going to prospect those clients based on the segmentation. You are then going to reach out to them either in a social network or an individual network or a personal network environment. You're going to approach them. You're going to sell them. And if you convert them to a sale, you then got them locked in for more products in the future for upselling and cross-selling opportunities for maximum revenue generation. You have to go through the sales cycle with the, with the prospective clients. You need to prospect them, you gotta reach out to them, you gotta communicate with them, you have to bring, um, you gotta get them motivated to buy either based on fear or greed or some other <coughs> type of need and you need to convert them at, uh, to becoming a client, and you gotta convert the sale. Um, and you gotta run through the cycle. And then you do it over and over again. And that's why the sales cycle is usually institutionalized, standardized, and then becomes part of the overall culture of the company, particularly the, sale, the business development and the sales teams. You need to have very high quality customer service and customer relations focused on customer retention and new customer acquisition. The systems that you can use uh, to be able to do that is your CRM or customer relationship management systems. You can use Microsoft or Salesforce as the enabling technology to be able to manage those systems. And you need customer feedback. You need to be constantly in touch with your customers, talking to them, surveying them, finding out what they like, what they don't like, what they need, what they want, and create a feedback loop 
um, to be able to develop new product uh, in continuous time uh, over time. So the models, the two models that are applicable to this um, theory is the S-curve and the product adoption cycle. Now the S-curve is the technology, the product adoption cycle is the product. We'll do the technology curve first. In technology or financial services technology or fine tech or whatever you want to call it, you usually have a series of what are called S-curves. And these S-curves are basically technologies that are introduced over time and they have an S-curve life cycle. They will basically be initiated, they will be adopted, and then they will degrade. You then um, introduce another product, it will go through the cycle again, you introduce the third and then the fourth technology or process. It's either going to generate revenue or cost savings or productivity gains. The key is to have successive series of technological innovation or S-curves because the successive series of the S-curves provides the revenue generation or the revenue growth path. So you have to constantly be innovating product and process. And in technology, it's process to be able to create productivity gains, profitability, or comparative advantages in the marketplace for market share acquisition. The second is the adoption cycle, the product adoption cycle. Now, when you're introducing a new product, um, you're gonna go through basically four phases. All products go through four phases of adoption. There's the innovator stage, which is usually flat. Takes, uh, could take a long time depending on the type of product. Um, you're trying to build awareness and you're trying to build adoption and scalability to your product. Then you move, once it starts to get adopted, you move into the early majority adoption phase where you get the hockey stick. You get exponential rental uh, or exponential revenue growth rates and client acquisition. So you better have the systems in place, both technologically and human capital and systems wide, to be able to handle the scalability and the scaling of the sales of those products. And that's what the uh, most of the VC guys and others who are investing in these companies are looking for. Can you handle the scalability? Can you handle the hockey stick? Can you handle rapid growth? Then you move into the majority phase. Your product has already been adopted by the majority of your market. Then if you don't change and you do not produce and you do not innovate, then you're, and you're basically tied to one type of product with similar attributes, the market will start to degrade and the only people that are left are the laggards. You're not gonna make the money off the laggards. You're gonna make the money on the early adopters as it starts to scale. So the strategy is to introduce multiple financial products and processes over time continuously so that a new product comes online right when you hit majority adoption of the prior product. And it's just like the S-curves, these could be product adoption cycles where you're introducing a series of products and processes continuously over time to generate a clear vision of, re of a revenue growth path to maximize stock value. And that's the number one objective of most corporations mainly public, <coughs> is by going public because I can scale and I can gain access to a large amount of money as I start to scale because it becomes very capital intensive. And if I can communicate, Apple is a good example, of the successive series of new products that are being introduced continuously over time, I can generate maximum revenue <coughs> and maximize the stock price for not only the stakeholders but the stockholders. So with financial feasibility that goes through all of this, you have to be cognizant of the R&D and the sunk costs. How much is it gonna to cost to product develop? If it costs too much, we're gonna to have to cut it. If I can deliver it for this and invest in this, but I get you know X cash flow growth rate over time and my net present value, present value, my internal rate of return are significant and meet my investors' criteria, we're in, we, we can do it. Um, most of the revenue growth is going to come from free cash flow because a lot of these companies are valued using EBIT, EBITDA, and the free cash flow. Okay, we're going to apply a multiple. Um, we we got to be able to look at the products and the processes from a financial feasible standpoint and be able to calculate 
fairly accurately present value, net present value, internal rate of return, modified internal rate of return in the break even. When are we going to break even on this thing? And then you have to have clearly defined rules based entrance and exit strategies. You got to know when to get out. If we do this and we build it and if we reach these milestones, then we are going to go IPO. We are going to sell to Google. We are going to be able to get out based on the criteria in which we laid out. It's not an emotional decision. It is a rules-based criteria. And if we meet the criteria that basically tells us to exit, then we exit. And that's it. Any comments? Any questions? This is, this is standard. This is totally standard. But it's applied to financial services and enabled through financial analytics. Okay, so I got like 15 minutes. Anybody have any comments or questions? No? Okay. So this process invented the uh, derivatives market. The derivatives market was the product of this. The investment management business, the banking business, the currency business. So this is all being applied, and now it's all being applied in a, in a fi financial tech sense. So now technology has been applied to finance. And, it's, and we're only in the early stages of development. We're probably here. We're probably down in here. We probably have two or three more S-curves S to go. And there's plenty more products that can be developed to meet uh, customer needs. So you want to click that off and then we'll do this.